Chapter 11, Part 4 Post-Historic Culture All the parts of the mega machine, which is today's technological world, were independently invented with little conscious anticipation of the human results, except in utopias and science fiction fantasies. Though specific and limited purposes entered into every stage of this scientific and technical development, the coalescence of these purposes into an increasingly coherent structure, self-organizing and self-expanding in seemingly automatic fashion, was in fact the outcome of the many conscious intelligences that had brought it into existence. In this respect, both its purposefulness and its highly complex ultimate character, the composition of the mega machine resembles a language. It is only in the final stage of organized complexity that one can even guess in what direction the whole evolutionary process had increasingly been t had increasingly been tending. To understand fully what happened earlier, one must read backward from the present to the past. Yet since technics is at every point a function of life, the excessive overgrowth of the o and overintegration of technical processes must threaten like any other organic imbalance, many equally essential functions of life. So at odds with the ultimate unitary organization of the mega machine, with the diverse requirements and prerogatives of the originally, in of the originally independent and autonomous human groups that fashioned it, that even before the mega machine could transform itself into a gigantic self-sufficient unit from which the human parts have been extruded, a reaction has begun to set in of which the present critical analysis is itself an example. Fortunately, the mega machine has not yet been fully assembled. Fortunately, too, it has already exposed itself as subject to miscalculations and ignominious breakdowns that lower the authority of its official caste and call into question both their basic assumptions and their ultimate objectives. In appraising these results, one is drawn back once more to the observations of Henry Adams. In analyzing the constant acceleration of scientific knowledge and extra-organic sources of energy since the 13th century, he observed, but if in the prodigiously rapid vibrations of its last phases, thought should continue to act as the universal solvent, which it is, and should reduce the forces of the molecules, the atom and the electrons, to the costless servitude to which it has reduced the old elements of earth, air, fire, and water, if man should continue to set free the infinite forces of nature and attain control of cosmic forces on a cosmic scale, the consequences may be as surprising as the change of water to vapor, of the worm to the butterfly, of radium to electrons." Unquote. That prediction has, even at this early stage, proved sounder than any of Adams's immediate contemporaries were prepared to believe. Such a retrogression, retrogressive transformation of man was first explicitly analyzed in Roderick Seidenberg's disturbing but acute analysis. Post-historic man, as pictured by Seidenberg, Seidenberg, this mindless creature would be the ironic end product of evolution achieved through a hypertrophy of man's dominant trait, his intelligence. As science and techniques advanced, Seidenberg pointed out, man alone appeared in a wayward and unpredictable entity in an otherwise tractable universe. If science, quote, required, unquote, man to look upon himself objectively as part and parcel of his own system, he too had to become amenable to engineering, to engineering calculation. Such a situation would in time become intolerable, once intelligence turned by its own logic against human organism itself. In short, the huge surprise already visible in the totalitarian triumph of science megatechnics is nothing less than man's own meek submission to the anti-human instruments that the human mind created. But that feat must bring its own nemesis. The cutting off of pure intelligence from all its self-regulating, self-protecting organic sources, since the unique property that cannot be transferred to any kind of programmed automation is life itself. Seidenberg regarded this change as an irreversible process of biological evolution, 
which, by favoring the development of intelligence in the hom hominidae and then in Homo sapiens himself, would now force man to return to a state of docile somnol somnolence, somnolence, ultimately into unconsciousness. This would be even worse than animal lethargy, for the accidental genetic mutations, the ceaseless environmental challenges, and the purposeful subjective gropings that promoted animal evolution would now be kept from interfering with the fixed plans of a post-humanoid intelligence to ensure its own continued control on the lines established and fixed by the mega machine. Happily, this neat, all too neat biological interpretation of man's ultimate destiny rests on abstractions and purely logical deductions that are highly questionable. Man's biological emergence during the last two million years has indeed accelerated, and it has done so mainly in one direction, in the enlargement of the nervous system, under an increasingly unified cerebral direction. But it is not intelligence alone that has been the beneficiary of this growth. The range of emotions, feelings, imaginative intuitions as expressed in moral culture, human intercourse, and the arts, likewise has been immensely increased. Seidenberg, Seidenberg, like Arthur Clarke, chooses to overlook that efflorescence of the human psyche. Mankind has enriched itself by the immense storage of artifacts and symbols that more than equal in meaning and value the products of the abstract intelligence, especially the limited pragmatic intelligence that has tied itself so closely to the power complex. There are already many evidences for human resistance to disintegrations that Seidenberg did not reckon with. We shall, and we shall soon have to examine the more destructive reg regressions that the last half century has already disclosed. Not the least safeguard against the terminal process that Seidenberg describes, with man himself sinking into torpid universal hibernation, is the upsurgence of those primitive vitalities and that unconsciously and sometimes with savage irrationality, correct the misbehaviors of cold intelligence. Our present over-reliance on the computer model intelligence might, in event of a worldwide catastrophe brought on by its lack of human dimensions, induce such a paroxysm of collective rage and unrestrained violence as would destroy the entire structure long before it had reached its ideal terminus of absolute control. Yet, if intelligence were actually increasing, it might overcome its narcissistic love of its own abstract image and exert itself to circumvent this destiny. An alert intelligence should be capable of modifying its false current premises and overcoming its own inherent limitations. Is this not, is this not indeed, I shall soon ask, what may already be beginning to happen? What gives Seidenberg's analysis some weight, however, is that the aberration he describes is not solely the work of our own generation, inflated by the success of its scientists in, penet in penetrating some of the long-hidden secrets of both atoms and cosmos. The concepts that make these precipitous applications of one-generation knowledge so compulsive have had a long history. Yet even such a human, humane mind as that of Teilhard de Chardin Despite his training in a religious order skilled in ferreting out the temptations of pride and power, fell under the same spell. Quote, with our knowledge of hormones, he observed, quote, we appear to be, unquote, uh, he observed, quote, we appear to be on the eve of having a hand in the development of our own, of our bodies, and even our brains. With the discovery of genes, it appears that we shall soon be able to control the mechanism of heredity, unquote. Perhaps nothing is so well perhaps nothing so well illustrates the fascination that the audacious pretensions of the power complex exert power complex exert over the human mind than the fact that possibly the most attractive and animated version of its ultimate potentialities and its final character is that put forward by this same Jesuit father in the series of books that began with the phenomenon of man Books whose slippery logical pavement is treacherously concealed by a fresh snowfall of gleaming metaphors. 
Teilhard de Chardin, Teilhard de Chardin's picture of human development rests mainly on his interpretation of organic evolution. In his approach to the future, however, he adds a new sphere of geology. Besides the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, he detects another sphere, which he calls the noosphere, the film of mind, of quote, mind, that is now spreading around the earth, forming a distinct, increasingly unified layer of conscious cerebration. This process he calls the unification, technification, growing rationalization of the human earth, unquote. In effect, this is an ethereal Lized version, an etherealized version of the mega machine. As it happens, Teilhard, Teilhard de Chardin was only putting in more explicit quasi scientific terms a thought that Nathaniel Hawthorne had uttered a century earlier through the mouth of Clifford in the quote, The House of the Seven Gables. Quote, then there is electricity, the demon, the angel, the mighty physical power, the all pervading intelligence, exclaimed Clifford. Quote, is it a fact that, by means of electricity, the world of matter has become a great nerve, vibrating thousands of miles in a breathless point of time? Rather, the, glo the round globe is a vast head, a brain, instinct with intelligence, or shall we say, it is itself a thought, nothing but thought, and no longer the substance which we deemed it. In a few sentences, this poetic mind had identified, long before professional physicists, the new agency that would shatter the whole mechanical world picture. Teilhard de Chardin's contribution was to carry Hawthorne's intuition one stage further, but in doing so, he gave it a profoundly reactionary turn. By attaching it to the human motivations, the amplification of a sterile intelligence and the conquest of nature that belonged to the original power system. His etherealized mega machine was equally, in, equally inimical to the autonomous, individuating, self-transcending traits disclosed in human evolution. In the final stage of development, as he envisioned it, identifiable human beings will have disappeared, reduced to mere specialized cells, like those of the heart or the kidney, with no life purpose except that which serves the noosphere, at this point, conscious existence will have shifted to a kind of ectoplasmic superbrain, all-knowing, all-powerful. In creating this far from loving God, man will have decreated nature and destroyed himself. Anything like a full critical appraisal of Teilhard de Chardin's thought would be irrelevant here. As a paleontologist, the co-discoverer of Peking Man, Peking Man, he spoke with authority in his chosen field, and he was quicker than many other scientists to come to the now almost inescapable conclusion in the light of molecular physics that the physical cosmos itself has experienced history, and that this historic process, beginning with the autonomous organization and specification of the atomic elements, has gone on without a break through more complex atoms and higher forms of organization until immensely complex organic molecules became self-replicating forms of life. And with life came, at one of the late, latest stages of animal evolution, consciousness and purposeful organization, so far well. Taylor de Chardin's further description of mind, however, is what must be subject to searching analysis. For his interpretation of man's coming evolution rests on his embracing without critical revision the notion that has been current since the 17th century, namely, that consciousness is measured by human intelligence, what consciousness is measured by intelligence, and that intelligent and that the intelligence, in an increasingly abstract, abstract mathematical form, is the highest manifestation of the mind. William Blake might have saved him from the air, for with his mind, for 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 with his anxiety, well, William Blake might have saved him from this air, for with his anxiety over the possible consequences of Newtonian physics. The poet had written, God forbid that truth should be confined to mathematical demonstrations. Unquote. But if Teilhard de Chardin's premises were true, then this apotheosis of abstract intelligence, as embodied in the theorems of science and the magical practices of technics, would be the far-off divine event toward which all creation moves. To avoid distrust, to avoid distrust and contention, let me quote his exact words in the, quote, Future of Man. 
the proof of man's ultimate destiny, according to Chardin, is already visible. For, quote, in fields embracing every aspect of physical, of physical matter, life, and thought, the research work workers are to be numbered in hundreds of thousands. Research, which until yesterday was a luxury pursuit, is in process of becoming major. Indeed, the principal, indeed the principal function of humanity. As of the significance of this great event, I, for my part, can see only one way to account for it. It is the enormous surplus of free energy released by the infolding of the noosphere, destined by a natural evolutionary process to flow into constructions and functioning of what I have called its brain. Precise, quote, brain. Precisely, and in this narrowing of the processes of life in the pursuit and projection of organized intelligence, alone, the infinite potentialities of living systems as developed in our, on our own planet would be reduced to a trivial fraction. Those which would further rational with which would further rational organization and centralized control. This whole transformation will be directed, on Teilhard de Chardin's terms, toward the point where the entire noosphere would function as a single world brain, in which individual souls would lose their identity and forfeit their uniqueness as self-directing organisms in order to exalt and magnify the process of thought itself, thought thereby turning in upon itself and becoming the sole viable manifestation of life. While Descartes had made the first step toward this, I think, therefore I am, Teilhard de Chardin's exalted in the terminal process, quote, quote, the big brain there thinks, therefore I am not. At the omega point, at the quote omega point, according to him, uh, at the quote omega point, at, at the quote omega point, unquote, according to him, cosmic evolution will have reached its consummation. This would indeed approach the heavenly nirvana of the quote now generation, electronic salvation disguised as Christian fulfillment. Such a description of the ultimate reign of pure intelligence is not science, but mythology and eschatology. And its merit from the standpoint taken here is that it has made explicit and underlying dogmatic premises of the metaphysics and theology of the mega machine. This extinction of the human personality by absorption into the noosphere, under the noosphere, the no, the noosphere, under the eternal embrace of its electronic God, is for Teilhard de Chardin the ultimate destiny of man. Quote, we conceive the ego, unquote, he wrote, quote, to be diminishing and eliminating itself, and the trend to what is most real and most 